Thank you for joining us. My name is Arzu Osandu. My colleagues Kabiri Robinson and Christian Kapitescu and I are coming to you from the University of Washington's Simpson Center for the Humanities. With support from the Mellon Foundation, we are pleased to present this Sawyer seminar entitled Humanitarianisms, Migrations and Care Through the Global South. Today, we launch this year-long comparative study of humanitarianism in which we seek to decolonize the rhetoric and understanding of humanitarianism by examining the histories and practice of care for forced migrants that have developed outside of the global north. This seminar is grounded in a set of theoretical and philosophical concerns about the traditions of care and cultures of hospitality in parts of the world that are actually responsible for hosting the lion's share of the world's forced migrants. Indeed, some 85% of forced migrants seek shelter and remain in the global south, primarily in Muslim majority countries. So we have invited the speakers in this series to consider the discursive processes through which entire regions of the world were written out of the narrative of the origins of an impulse to humanitarian care. We seek to move beyond the global north as the primary locus of study and understanding of humanitarianism and emphasize experiences across the global south with a particular comparative focus on South and Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and Africa regions which have been conceptually marked off from understandings of humanitarianism, but which have hosted the bulk of the world's refugees since World War II. Across three thematic clusters over the course of this academic year, namely decentering migration and decolonizing humanitarianism, comparative humanitarianisms, and rethinking the human, we will compare important conceptual categories that organize humanitarian practices. These comparisons will allow us to illuminate how values beyond those of the Western Enlightenment constitute objects of suffering, practices of care, and who or what qualifies as worthy of that care. I now turn to my colleague, Kaviri Robinson, for a few additional remarks. So our fall theme is decentering migration and decolonizing humanitarianism. This part of the Sawyer seminar focuses on the history of forced migration within and across the global south. Through this focus on the global south, we aim to examine humanitarian practices that emerge in relation to, but not necessarily from, a Euro-American genealogy set within the politics of asylum and refugee laws that first grew out of World War II. We believe that the work of decentering migration and decolonizing humanitarianism requires two key intellectual moves. The first is to reorient our perspective on the primary spaces of care by focusing on, fo on forced migrants in the global south, the primary sites for hosting, and on these host countries and communities' experiences and practices of hosting. The second is to move away from a primarily Euro-American intellectual history in order to consider ideological underpinnings of caring for distant others outside of Enlightenment frames. We envision that such comparative reorientations will transform our perspectives on humanitarian care to integrate diverse rationalities and the forms of expertise that underlie them. Speakers in our fall events examine how, for example, international laws and treaties of the colonial period shaped global categories of compulsory migration and defined some as worthy of extraordinary care, such as fleeing political and religious persecution, as opposed to others which were set aside, such as compulsory migration that was tied to economic or to environmental conditions. <laughs> 
It is with great pleasure that we welcome Anne McNevin as the inaugural speaker to this series of public presentations and discussions in the Humanitarianism series. Her extraordinary presentation examine how, examines how acts of welcome that invoke the right to extend hospitality are embedded in historical and hierarchical power relations. She also invites us to think with her about how repressive forms of border control that take up the language of humanitarianism may be subverted by diverse forms of care for strangers. I turn now to my colleague, Christian Kopetsku, who will introduce uh, Anne McNevin further to you. Thank you. And now let me introduce our speaker today. Dr. McNevin is Associate Professor and Chair of the Politics Department at the New School for Social Research in New York. She has advanced our understanding of irregular mig migration as a central aspect of citizenship and modern forms of sovereignty through her leadership as Associate Editor of the journal Citizenship Studies. Her scholarship on irregular and forced migration is grounded in a deep commitment to critical post and decolonial approaches to global politics. Dr. McNevin is the author of numerous articles and a monograph titled Contesting Citizenship, Irregular Migrants, and the New Frontiers of the Political, released by Columbia University Press in 2011. She is also the co-author of Hospitality as a Horizon of Aspiration, or What the International Refugee Regime Can Learn from Etchenese Fishermen, published in the Journal of Refugee Studies in 2018. In her talk today, Sovereignty, Welcome, and Epistemic Hospitality, Dr. McNevin prompts us to consider how immigration detention in places like Manus Island, which was rationalized in terms of humanitarian protection, was deeply grounded in administrative strategies of removal, separation, and enclosure that long categorized white Australia's treatment of Aboriginal peoples who have sometimes identified as refugees within their own country. And now, without further ado, we bring to you Anne McNevin. Thank you so much, Christian, and I really look forward to the Q&A uh, after the talk everyone's about to see. Hello to everyone watching. Uh, I'm delighted to be speaking with you tonight and very honoured to have been invited as a guest speaker in this uh, Sawyer seminar. Um, I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of the histories of dispossession that are part of the conditions of possibility for me to be able to, to be here in New York speaking to you uh, and for you to be listening perhaps in a number of different places. Those histories include the dispossession of the, of the Lenape people in the New York region, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation in the Melbourne region, where much of this talk was prepared, and the Coast Salish peoples on whose land the University of Washington stands and from where the invitation to give this talk was issued. And I want to make that acknowledgement not as a prefix to the substance of this talk, but as the basis from which it proceeds. I want to ground this talk in the proposition that in a settler colonial context, it's untenable to talk about hospitality to others, care for others as part of hospitality without situating that discussion in the histories of dispossession and the sovereign claims of Indigenous peoples. And I think this is a fitting place to situate a discussion that aims to explore questions of humanitarianisms, migration and care through the global south. Um, a designation that I take uh, to imply not only and not always a geographic formulation, but one that also signals racialized and hierarchical divides within what we think of as the global north. I begin this way also uh, with a good deal of gratitude for the organizers of this series, uh, the Simpson Center for the Humanities and the co-conveners, Kabiri Robinson and Azu Asanlu. Uh, and I thank them for formulating this discussion in a way that has prompted me to think much more reflexively about my own interventions uh, into discussions of borders, migration and hospitality, where they've fallen short of, of this baseline acknowledgement. I'd like to shape my talk around a gesture of welcome from Australian Aboriginal activists to refugees and other targets of Australia's border policing state. 
And this is a state that couches very brutal forms of border control in the language of humanitarianism. So by way of background, Australia in 2001 launched what came to be known as the Pacific solution to its asylum seeker problem. This entailed excising uh, Australian island territories from the Australian migration zone. This was a legal fiction which suspended the full force of Australian migration law on certain territories and uh, waters and facilitated the transfer of asylum seekers en route to the mainland to offshore detention camps in the Pacific, on Manus Island in Papua New Guinea, and on the island state of Nauru. In 2013, the entire Australian mainland was excised in this way, effectively removing the right to seek asylum on Australian territory for those arriving by boat. The measure was justified as humanitarian insofar as it removed any incentive for asylum seekers to board unseaworthy vessels in Indonesia and attempt to reach Australia in that way. And close to a thousand people had drowned at sea uh, doing just that uh, between 2001 and 2012. Politicians argued that these cruel to be kind measures were ultimately about saving lives. But what happened to those lives in their countries of origin or en route and now stuck in Indonesia uh, was not addressed with equal concern. As a result of these measures, thousands of men, women and children have been detained offshore in many cases for months and sometimes years under conditions that medical professionals describe as akin to torture under conditions designed to persuade those detained to give up and go home, as an example to others, and resulting in what Médecins Sans Frontières have described as catastrophic mental health conditions amongst the worst the agency has ever seen. And to date, uh, 13 people have died uh, in the offshore camps or from inju injuries sustained therein. So this is the context in which Aboriginal activist uh, of the Krautungalong people, Robbie Thorpe, and Wiradjuri elder Ray Jackson held a series of passport ceremonies between 2010 and 2014. They so they presented First Nation passports to asylum seekers detained in Sydney, uh, to the families of refugees who had died in Australia's offshore camps, and in absentia to Tamil asylum seekers stuck in Indonesia who had been intercepted and returned by the Australian Navy, uh, as well as to Palestinian refugees in camps in Gaza and the West Bank. In a commentary on the offshore detention of asylum seekers, Ray Jackson declared, and I quote, his disgust with the social and criminal abomination that is being done in our name by our governments. He went on, I do not accept that they have that right to dictate who comes seeking refuge on stolen Aboriginal lands. And he continued, I, as a Wiradjuri man, say to those asylum seekers, you are most welcome to our lands. Now, because of the non-recognition of Aboriginal sovereignty under Australian law, the passports carried no legal force. So this was largely a symbolic gesture and certainly not one that has any claim to represent the sentiments of Aboriginal people in general. But precisely because these passports don't rely on formal state law for their intelligibility, I find them helpful uh, examples to think with. So I'd like to draw on this gesture as a provocation to reflect on the form of hospitality it might be said to signal and the grounds from which that hospitality might be said to proceed. And where I'd like to get to is a discussion of the epistemic dimensions of this gesture of welcome, how it signals different ways of knowing the parties to an encounter that is usually figured somewhat un unproblematically in terms of a host guest relation. And I think, I, I hope this epistemic discussion resonates with the spirit of this seminar series, uh, which I take to resist the reduction of organized forms of hospitality to humanitarian border security and to be exploring forms of care for the stranger 
beyond Eurocentric norms of humanitarianism. So what are the different ways in which the issue of Aboriginal passports to refugees might be read? In one sense, the gesture is a refusal to endorse the violence done to others in our name by our governments, uh, as Ray Jackson puts it, and an expression of solidarity with those to whom that violence is directed. So there are many continuities between immigration detention, rationalised in terms of humanitarian protection, and administrative strategies of removal, separation and enclosure that have long characterised white Australia's treatment of uh, Indigenous and immigrant others. While the forms of violence are not the same, uh, Aboriginal Australians have sometimes expressed affinity with the sufferings of displaced peoples, uh, sometimes identifying as refugees in their own country, and famously erecting a tent embassy on the grounds of the federal parliament in the 1970s, uh, which, stays, which has stayed until today. But there's more here than a refusal to endorse a particularly violent strategy of border security. At stake is the more fundamental question of who exactly is authorised to extend or deny welcome on account of sovereign authority. The passports assume and pre perform Aboriginal authority to decide on matters of welcome in defiance of a state which claims authority over unceded land. As a dramatization of this sovereign dispute, the gesture might be said to invert claims to sovereign control uh, rather than disrupt systems of rule that rest upon them. So from this perspective, the gesture might be read as a crude assertion of original possession, in something like, this is my land, not yours, I was here first. From this perspective, the hospitality gesture does not differ in principle from that extended by any group that stakes its claim to welcome selected guests on the basis of an autochthonous understanding of itself as rightful host. A version of this interpretation is made by Nandita Sharma in her recent book, Home Rule, uh, though not with respect to this specific example. Sharma argues that claims to Indigenous sovereignty reproduce what she calls, critically, the post-colonial New World Order. This is an order, she says, whereby self-rule can only be legitimised by a claims to native status, a native status that reflects imperial category distinctions between native and migrant. For Sharma, this logic connects a number of different claims to native status, including the Lockean and white nationalist claims to be sovereign over land by virtue of improving it. So nativization, uh, if you like, via improvement. The autochthonous claims of groups asserting native status in formerly colonized states of Africa and distinguishing themselves from migrants who settled after colonization. Nativist Europeans who claim they are being colonized by migrants from Africa. And the interpolation in settler colonial contexts of all migrants as settler colonials, including those whose arrival was by way uh, of, was forced by way of slavery, uh, indentured labour or the global circulation of the working poor. So for Sharma, each of these, albeit very different claims to native status, uh, to original or overriding forms of sovereignty, all of them rearrange rather than transcend an exclusionary logic as the hallmark of sovereignty, and all of them generate new kinds of insiders and outsiders. Sharma's analysis, uh, for me, is at its best when it shows how the reduction of self-rule to national liberation via the establishment of nominally sovereign post-colonial states fails to deliver on the promise of decolonization. But I think she is wrong to insist that Indigenous sovereign claims can only be understood as a flat reproduction of the sovereign form that prevails in the contemporary world order. And I'll return to this point shortly. 
In his book, The Design Politics of the Passport, Mahmoud Keshavaz conducts an ethnography of passport forgery. He quote, quotes from an interview with Amir Haidari, who is a prominent passport forger, uh, whose crime or craft, uh, depending on your perspective, has been uh, really quite central in securing the entry of thousands of people into Europe. Haidari understands his work as an explicitly political practice. He argues that yes, he's creating a fake, but that all passports are fake insofar as they reproduce and enforce borders that are arbitrarily drawn and contested. For him, the passport is a tactic in a struggle between competing fakes. So extrapolating from this perspective, Aboriginal passports in the Australian context might be interpreted as a similar kind of tactic, as a play on authenticity itself, a gesture that works to satirise the notion of the real passport and of the authoritative and unambiguous host, a gesture that calls these forms of documentation and status into question, even while it mobilises a particular kind of authenticity in order to do so. So this interpretation would work against su the substance of any claim to authorise entry and exit. One passport intervenes against the monopoly power of another, but the force of its challenge is ultimately rests on the same ruse that the more powerful party has been uh, successful in monopolising to its own advantage. This interpretation, I would suggest, flattens out the very different positionalities of parties to sovereign disputes, stemming from the very the far from arbitrary ways in which borders uh, and more generally um, the ways of demarcating land as territory and property, the way those things have been deployed very systematically to displace, discredit and eliminate counter-sovereign claims by Indigenous people and Indigenous peoples themselves. It also face, fails to countenance the ways that sovereign authority to authorise entry and exit might also be deployed as part of decolonising strategies. So in a context in which sovereign dispossession structures the terrain in play, any call to deny the legitimacy of sovereign authority in general impacts those with contending sovereign claims very differently. Joseph Puglesi acknowledges this decolonizing potential of sovereign claims in his interpretation of the Aboriginal passports as a re-signification of the very technologies deployed to usurp Indigenous sovereignty. In his reading, the master's tools are flipped, so to speak, to restore a proper Indigenous sovereign relation via an expression of welcome. But this interpretation in turn stops short of articulating whether and how Indigenous sovereign claims differ from those of the state, and specifically in ways that might enliven other grounds from which to be hospitable. Many Indigenous scholars and activists argue that what is at stake in Indigenous relations to land, law and governance is not reducible to what Gunpul scholar Eileen Morton Robinson calls the possessive logics of sovereign territorial state claims. Now this may be true even while the language deployed to make Indigenous claims, land, territory, rights, embassies, passports, and sovereignty itself, even while that language deploys the trappings of state authority to wield its force. This conceptual and legal apparatus is at least in part designed to be legible and authoritative within the legal systems that prevail. But it's a leap to assume that these words convey a full and accurate expression of concepts and categories for which there may be no equivalent reference points in non-Indigenous languages, non-Indigenous legal systems and life worlds. So more than a problem of linguistic translation, this is a matter of contending epistemes, 
And one of the clearest accounts of this problem uh, that I have read is given by Robert Nichols in his recent book, Theft is Property. Roberts begins from the seeming contradiction between Indigenous claims on one hand to be rightful owners over land that has been stolen from them, and on the other hand, the proposition made by Indigenous peoples that land and earth are not things that can be reduced to property, owned by title, or things over which one can exercise control. Nichols argues that what seems to be a contradiction here is based on a misrepresentation of precisely what is at stake in what he calls recursive dispossession. This process, he argues, involves what we can think of as theft if we assume a sovereign proprietary relation to land. And of course, that is what's assumed in prevailing legal systems. But it also involves the active production of that proprietary relation as the only way of accounting for what one can be said to be dispossessed of in the first place. So by this reasoning, the claim to be dispossessed of sovereignty is also a claim to be subject to a form of epistemic violence that nullifies other non-proprietary conceptions of sovereignty, even as possibilities. So Nichols' formulation, which draws heavily on the work of Eileen Morton Robinson, acknowledges the very real sense in which Indigenous peoples experience colonisation as a form of theft. The sense, for example, in which Ray Jackson disputes the right of the Australian government to deny entry to stolen Aboriginal lands. But his formulation also acknowledges the insufficiency of theft to fully account for the forms of loss at stake. At one point, he suggests the term desecration as a partial approximation that gestures at once towards destruction of land, removal from land, and the erasure of systems of meaning in which land and place take form. But his point is really that precise vocabulary for the forms of loss at stake may not be available. Because of this epistemic dimension of dispossession, it's difficult to comprehend exactly what Indigenous sovereignty could mean, at least from a non-Indigenous perspective such as my own. But the research that I have done is enough to convince me that a certain reflexive acknowledgement of precisely those limits to knowledge that I embody must be part of the humility brought to bear on any discussion of sovereign right and of rightful hospitality and requires some effort to listen to Indigenous articulations of sovereignty and of hospitality. Palaku legal scholar Amberlyn Kwaimulina, based in Western Australia, explains that what she calls narrative forms of sovereignty experienced, uh, it's evidenced, sorry, in the form of song, dance, art or ceremony have been poorly understood within epistemes that privilege other forms of literacy. In her writing, she points to Aboriginal conceptions of time and space in which it doesn't make sense to distinguish past from present in ways that could neatly separate original forms of sovereignty from contemporary networks and relationships between humans and non-human entities through which decision-making authority is established. As a consequence, she explains, a system of law based in narrative sovereignty asks very different questions of those who would assert authority over land, including the authority to be hospitable. Rather than seeking to establish exclusive title or possession, such a system would prompt the following questions, she says, and I quote, what are your stories? Where is the evidence of your understanding of the networks of living beings that comprise country? How do you understand your place within these networks? Which is to say, can you enumerate your relationships and in so doing, explain both your rights and responsibilities." End quote. 
Important here is the sense in which sovereign authority cannot be abstracted from embodied, situated emplacement within a network of relations and the narrative capacity to articulate oneself within those relations. So from this perspective, a generalized conception of indigenous sovereignty or right of hospitality that might follow from it risks abstracting from the very relations that would shape its expression and form its distinctiveness in place. So efforts to learn from and gen a generalized conception of Indigenous sovereignty would risk yet again very familiar forms of romanticization, essentialization, appropriation, mistranslation and so on regardless of the goodwill that might be involved in, in seeking to uh, learn from Indigenous conceptions of such things. So here I seem to reach a limit of efforts to interpret at a distance the meanings bound up with the grant of Aboriginal passports to refugees. But I also don't want to disengage from the significance of that gesture only because I can't come to a de definitive understanding of it. And this is where I think it begins to make more sense in the context of me talking to you here at a distance to engage with this gesture of welcome as an epistemic provocation. So let me try and explain what I mean by that, by drawing on Indigenous thinkers who link the concept of sovereignty to the concept of responsibility. Responsibility is theorised by a collective of Indigenous and non-Indigenous thinkers located in Yolngu North East Arnhem Land, Australia, who list the Bawaka country of North East Arnhem Land as the lead author in a 2019 article. For Yolngu people, the collective explains, country is the term for land and home and water and all the beings that come into existence in and through this more than human set of relations. The authorship of this article, as much as its contents, reflects the relational ontologies through which Indigenous knowledge is produced. From this starting point, the collective explains, one does not care for country, but as country. One is not responsible to country or for country, but as country. As the collective puts it, this challenges asymmetrical and unidirectional not notions of responsibility. Drawing on materialist feminist theorizations of responsibility proceeding from relational ontologies, the collective argues that responsibility as the Waka country implies both response and ability, the ability to pay attention and an imperative to respond as part of that which demands response. So this relation to country has very little to do with ownership and control. This sense of response and ability towards that which is part of us also comes through in the work of Waramai scholar Victoria Reeves, uh, writing from Victoria in Australia, who addresses more directly the matter of contemporary border controls. Reeves calls to engage refugees detained on Manus Island in Papua New Guinea in Australia's offshore detention camps as parties to a collective refounding of an Australian Republic. For Greaves, those detained offshore are not outsiders, but part of this thing now called Australia, albeit by virtue of exclusion, and already inseparable from any sense in which an us that might host exists. Her call follows from a wider Indigenous Australian call for a Makarata Commission, where Makarata is defined as a coming together after a struggle. This call was made in the 2017 Uluru Statement from the Heart, uh, a statement produced through a long process of Indigenous discussion in response to calls for constitutional reform 
to formally recognise uh, Australia's Indigenous peoples. The statement called for a program of action rather than symbolic forms of recognition. And that program would include an institutionalised Indigenous voice to Parliament, truth telling about collective histories, and agreement making or treaty making as the culmination of this process. It would be a process through which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples would be engaged as sovereign peoples. Now, whether one might want to shoot for a republic as the outcome of this process is less important here than the processual and relational nature of what I take Greaves to be proposing. Her insistence that offshore refugees become part of this process can be read as a gesture of welcome and of hospitality, but also as a refusal to reduce that gesture to the unidirectional actions of a magnanimous host. Greaves proposes, for example, that Kurdish Iranian refugee Beirouz Bushani's letter from Manus Island be taken as one of several founding documents for a new Australian Republic. Bushani's open letter was written in 2017 as well, um, as refugees on Manus rose up in rebellion against their incarceration. In the letter, Bushani challenges Australians to see what he describes in very graphic and torturous detail as Manus prison. He challenges Australians to see Manus prison as consistent with the treatment of Aboriginal people rather than an aberration in an otherwise progressive national story. And of course, the account of this being an aberration, of being not who we are as a people, was very much the focal point uh, of progressive and refugee advocate perspectives uh, on offshore detention. Bushani's dispatch was in effect a call for truth-telling about Australia's past and present about the continuities between Australia's colonial, settler colonial and border policing violence. The letter was issued from the perspective of the stranger, the would-be guest, in an extraordinary act of care and respect, I would suggest, for those in whose name his years of imprisonment was, was authorised. In response, Greaves accepts the care extended by Bushani and invites him to be part of a coming together, to be part of a process, to be part of that process in his own words. And she does this by submitting those words in the form of his letter, his rebuke and invitation to Australian people uh, as part of a set of foundational documents that would ground the process to come. On both sides of this exchange, we move well away from the kinds of sentiments, especially compassion, that frame humanitarian gestures towards suffering displaced people. We also move well away from hospitality as a host guest relation of benevolence and supplication. Both parties express forms of care in an entirely different register care as regard for the perspective of the stranger who has become part of us. Care for those to whom one cannot do other than direct one's response and ability, precisely because their existence is overtly bound to the self. Wrapped up in this exchange, I want to suggest, is an effort to bring multiple forms of knowledge to bear upon an encounter that is typically forged in binary terms of host and guest. An effort to bring forms of knowledge together that hold those categories, host and guest, in contention, starting from the basis of their intimate relation. To the extent that hospitality remains a politically generative practice with which to engage migration and care in settler colonial contexts, then that sense of contention would seem to be essential at a very minimum. 
If that is the case, then the starting point is not so much how to be hospitable or what degree of hospitality should be extended, but how to grapple with hospitality as a situated question in which power is always present. How to grapple with hospitality as a practice that cannot claim purity or innocence, but also seems imperative in the face of dispossession and displacement. How might acts of welcome recalibrate hospitality beyond binary, hierarchical and paternalistic forms to be conscious of power as a starting point? And how might it extend to the kinds of epistemic relations I've referred to in this talk? Whether acts of welcome can do that work and how remains an open question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne, so much for your very, very thoughtful presentation. Um, I'm going to invite now that the participants in this webinar, uh, please use your Q&A webinar function to post questions. Christian, our moderator, is going to bring them forward for your attention, Anne. And in the interim, we do have one question to open this discussion. And could you please tell us a little bit about the origins of your research project on Aboriginal passport ceremonies and Australia's cruel to be kind practices? You've highlighted here in this talk the work of Indigenous Aboriginal scholars, activists, and intellectuals, and you've made some references that indicate how they interact with detained refugees and asylum seekers in the offshore detention facilities such as Manus Island. Um, I was wondering, could you tell us a little bit more about some of the kinds of observations, fieldwork, textual sources that are available to you as a researcher in the context of Australia's new Pacific solution? Thanks, Kabiri, uh, for the question. Um, so this, this is brand new work for me, um, but it is part uh, of um, a new book project that I'm working on, where I try to think through the connections between anti-racist, anti-colonial and pro-migrant forms of organising and look to uh, social movements and other forms of activism as sources of theory for other forms of governance, less violent forms of governance uh, in relation to human mobility. Um, so I've been following Australia's Pacific Solution and border policing for, for a long time. Um, I've drawn on uh, the different textual debates uh, in relation to them. I've tracked policy changes. I've tracked the protests within uh, detention centres uh, by refugees themselves. And, and I've also tracked the terms in which uh, refugee advocates um, and supporters have, have made their kinds of arguments. And increasingly, though, what I'm drawing on are written accounts by refugees and uh, others detained themselves and ex-detainees, whether, um, whether that comes in the form of their own journalism, of essays, of novels and poetry, of sort of um, Facebook posts, online statements and things like that. And this is both um, testimonial in form, but also deeply analytical in form. And so I'm trying to engage with that kind of work as um, both theory in itself and as provoking uh, theoretical debate, uh, much more so than, or, or certainly in equal measure to the sense in which it might, um, you know, be seeking practical political change. Um, the Indigenous focus for me is new, and but in a similar way, so I'm drawing on Indigenous thinkers, Indigenous activists, their articulations of sovereignty, dispossession, and both at the conceptual and political level. Um, I'm following policy changes, legal battles, strategic cases around the deployment of sovereignty, uh, membership, citizenship, concepts like that, and how they shift in legal terrain. And um, again, thinking through those things as, as sources of theory uh, and as uh, theoretical interventions to engage with. So, so that's been my approach uh, for this project. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn to Christian now to bring forward some of the questions that have been posted during this webinar. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so our first question is, and your conceptual framing of epistemic forms of hospitality opens an intriguing window into a world of non-material practices of solidarity. 
At the same time, your point that the realm of symbolics and gestures is imbued with powerful new meanings that might help extend our understanding of hospitality and as such of alternative kinds of non-Western humanitarianisms could invite criticism because a core claim of humanitarian work is that what is at stake in, the, in humanitarianism is the improvement of the human condition, the alleviation of human suffering and the saving of human life. Um, so are these conditions possible to be advanced through the Aboriginal passport ceremonies? And if not, then how commensurate are these gestures with humanitarian assistance that engages in precisely such direct, physical, and sometimes perilous work. Um, thanks, Christian, for the, and the question. Um, so firstly, I guess I would distinguish between hospitality and humanitarianism. Um, so uh, none of these gestures have been framed in terms of humanitarianism. Um, and of course, that's sort of a, a logic that is, um, you know, being critiqued as deeply paternalistic uh, and, uh, and, and uh, problematic, divisive, hierarchical in, in, in lots of ways. Um, so, and, and it's fair to say that the Aboriginal passports themselves were not um, articulated, at least in the sort of ceremonies that I'm aware of uh, and the forms of documentation that, that I'm aware of. Um, in terms of hospitality as such. So that is sort of my, you know, um, theoretical overlay, my um, reading and questioning uh, of, what these, uh, of what these gestures uh, could mean. Uh, so I don't want to sort of a, a attribute that to, to the authors of this of these gesture. Um, for me, it's not so much about um, signing on to hospitality as as the concept, the theoretical framework through which it's best to consider these gestures, or as I, as I tried to say in my talk, um, assuming that uh, uh, Aboriginal forms of hospitality either can be generalized about or that signal something that should operate as a kind of template. What I'm trying to get at is, is thinking through this particular form of activism, this particular generation of passports, as a way to question the basis on which any gesture of hospitality might proceed. Uh, and, that, and, and as one that is always, I want to say, invested with forms of power. So it's not so much about advocating hospitality, um, epistemic hospitality or other forms of hospitality as much as, as it is about problematizing it, even, even while we might uh, recognize that it's a uh, widely resonant and perhaps politically useful uh, concept with which to respond to the imperative right, of people uh, crossing borders, needing to move um, and, uh, and uh, you know, being in those uh, situations of forced migration and migration more generally. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so let's go to the next question. And you offer a fascinating account of symbolic gestures of hospitality from the vantage point of Australian First Nations activists. These groups could be classified as de facto benefactors of symbolic humanitarian benevolence. What about the beneficiaries uh, in the story? Do you have any insights about how many asylum seekers eventually took up the offer of receiving Aboriginal citizenship and how their relationship with Aboriginal activists developed throughout this passport campaign? Um, yeah, so no, that's, a, that's a good question. And um, so I, I also want to emphasize the sort of the symbolic it was a, the symbolic nature of this in the sense that um, these are not passports that, that can get you across a border. These are, you know, in a, in a sort of airport sense. Um, they don't come with, they, they, don't, um, they don't come with any sort of um, material legal force in that sense. Um, so I'm, I'm to be, it's a, it's a great question. And I think those, um, those uh, how they were received, how the families of the people who died, 
uh, in offshore detention received these, what the ongoing relationships were. Um, I think these are all really important things to investigate that I haven't had a chance to do yet. Um, but I think it's, it's precisely at those moments of exchange uh, and seeing what happens in people's um, own uh, sense of how they occupy that spectrum of host and guest, um, you know, how that, how that shifts through these kinds of gestures and, and uh, symbolic or otherwise. But the, I guess the, the one thing I would point to is the way that um, the whole question of uh, Aboriginal sovereignty, Aboriginal dispossession, um, and the continuities of Australia's uh, history and past and present in those respects has been very explicitly articulated in some of the refugee writings that have come from Manus Island and particularly in the journalism and writings of Beirut Bushani, who I mentioned. So um, even if there's not a sort of, or, or even if I you know, haven't, haven't researched the, um, the specific connections between the recipients of these passports directly, there is a kind of uh, very public um, uh, conversation going on and exchange uh, between um, uh, uh, those who are detained by under Australia's laws and uh, and Indigenous peoples. All right, we have a follow up question here regarding the testimonials. Um, do you have any insights into how uh, refugees in detention experience uh, the precarious nature of waiting? and what it means to be recognized again as human through these symbolic acts? Um, well, there, I mean, there are, there are a lot of um, testimonials of um, uh, all, all kinds of aspects of being in detention. And certainly that narrative of, um, of waiting is really prominent amongst them. I think one of the things that um, often differences are drawn between administrative forms of detention, like immigration detention and imprisonment. And one of the big differences um, often pointed to is the fact that um, criminal detention comes with an end point, right? There's an end to your sentence and administrative detention doesn't. It's at the, it's at the whim of a, of a, a government authority. Uh, and it's precisely that not knowing that, um, that living in you know, a limbo kind of status that um, causes uh, so much um, uh, mental and psychological damage, um, the sorts of which we've certainly seen in, in Australia's offshore centres. Um, look, I think I think in lots of the testimonials, the um, whether it's the extension of um, of these passports or or the letter writing campaigns, also that um, that uh, other people have done, or the sort of forms of um, even online relationships uh, that people have made with um, with detainees uh, while they've been imprisoned have been um, extremely meaningful to people. Um, uh, I'm not sure I can I can I can sort of generalize about the um, the, the the sentiments or feelings of of being being human or otherwise being humanized or dehumanized or otherwise um, through those relationships. But I think just the the forms of recognition through these kinds of interpersonal exchanges are, are, are very um, uh, meaningful to people who are otherwise in isolation. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so uh, one uh, audience member is appreciating your talk, so I just want to convey that. Um, and the question is here specifically, how does race overlay into the fight for sovereignty of Ab Aboriginal people in Australia and the example of a First Nations passport? Um, so many Aboriginal people identify as both Indigenous and Black, and in this context, it would be interesting to hear from your vantage point um, how this uh, sort of factors into contemporary conversations um, about race in the U.S. and globally. No, it's a great it's a great question, and it, it's true that in the um, context of, Austra of Indigenous Australia, um, to to be black is consistent with being Aboriginal. And um, this is some, sometimes very, when I sort of explain this to my students sometimes uh, in the US context, it's sometimes quite hard for people to understand because in the US context, the divisions between um, say, uh, 
being um, Indigenous and being Afri African American, for instance, are, are drawn very, very sort of tightly, and um, and and there have been, um, you know. Uh, all sorts of political tensions and historical tensions um, between groups as well that really complicate a politics of solidarity. Um, but at the moment, so and so what's interesting is that the radical black politics, uh, the history of radical black activism in the US context has been very influential. Uh, and there's been in the Australian context, there's been histories of exchange um, and uh, shared sort of strategies and forms of mobilization um, forms of analysis um, that have gone uh, on uh, throughout the, sort of the 20th century um, and sort of interconnected in, in interesting ways. Right now, um, these things come together very, very directly around um, the questions of police violence uh, and uh, in the Australian case, um, it, uh, Aboriginal deaths in custody. So at the time of the, um, the uprisings in the US around um, the um, death of uh, George, uh, George Floyd and the uprisings that we saw at that time and where these were, um, there were solidarity uh, uprisings and marches and protests all around the world. In the Australian context, they were very much focused uh, uh, around the Aboriginal deaths in custody and police violence against Aboriginal people. And the rates of incarceration of Aboriginal people in the Australian context are worse than the rates of the incarceration uh, of African Americans in the United States. Um, so, um, so it's at that level of um, the similarities. So not, not just around the question of whether one identifies as black or not, but the question of racialized police violence, uh, which is, of course, is, is also um, uh, an issue not just for um, African American people, but for racialized people in general in the US context as well. Um, that is where I think we're seeing real, very interesting, um, very substantive forms of collaboration, analysis, uh, and cross coalitional uh, movements, um, both, both in domestic and uh, transnational contexts. So, uh, so I think that's very, um, very exciting stuff and um, it's part of what I'm trying to look at in this research. Yeah, that's exciting. Thank you so much. We have time for one more question. Uh, so before we end, here is one more question. Could you speak a bit more about how the Pacific solution drew on colonial legacies of separation deployed against Aboriginal nations? Mm -hmm. So, um, so I guess there's, there's two sort of quick points uh, to say. Um, the Pacific solution um, comes as a result uh, or, or, or is not, um, has a relationship to Australia's colonial history in the Pacific. So the sites uh, of detention in Manus Island and Nauru are former um, uh, pro protectorates or mandated territories that were um, that Australia had uh, governance authority over um, after the uh, was given after the First World War when this mandate system was being uh, put in place in the sort of in the years sort of transitioning between formal colonies and uh, and um, and uh, and decolonization much later um, so that's one sort of historical legacy that is a part of this story um, the other is that um, island territories uh, of Australia have a long history as, um, as different kinds of sites of detention, including for Aboriginal people. Um, Aboriginal people have been removed from land and forced uh, into um, missions and, uh, and uh, similar to reservations in the, in the US and Canadian context. Um, and, um, and all of this actually also sort of overlaps with uh, sites of quarantine. And so interestingly, Christmas Island, which is one of um, Australia's, uh, is Australian territory, but it's, a, it's an island territory that's used for um, immigration detention, but was recently sort of transformed into a quarantine station for um, Australians returning from Wuhan at the start of the, of the COVID pandemic. So there is a kind of um, uh, 
logic of containment, of confinement in, in, remote, um, and, uh, uh, in remote territories and island territories and the designation of the space itself as exceptional that runs right throughout this history. Uh, and is sort of makes, um, so the technologies, the materialities, the sort of infrastructures of detention um, come through and, and emerge uh, through this um, colonial and set settler colonial history. And so that's, um, it's a sort of a material uh, way in which the continuity of these different kinds of colonial logics, I think becomes, becomes very manifest and becomes um, easier to see as something that is ongoing in the present, you know, the, the continuation of colonialism in a very material sense, um, rather than this sort of, you know, accounting for something that's um, apparently over and in the past. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Professor McNevin. That was brilliant. Um, with this last question, we have reached the end of today's webinar, sadly. Um, we would like to thank Anne McNevin for her amazing presentation um, and all of our listeners uh, for your interest and engagement. And we invite all of you to join us for our next live webinar on November 12th in an event which features professors Pamela Ballinger from the University of Michigan and Alana Feldman from George Washington University to discuss the 1951 Refugee Convention and the Humanitarian Rights of Palestinian Refugees. And on behalf of all of the organizers, we wish everyone, wherever you are, a wonderful evening, day, afternoon, morning, whatever. Thank you and good night.